Okay, so welcome everyone back to Cloud Computing and Big Data, lecture nine about PaaS, Platform as a Service. And it's an interesting topic because it lies between infrastructure as a service and software as a service and is somewhat not really having clear boundaries between these two worlds. We argued about MapReduce, which could be an infrastructure for some, but maybe a platform for others. And you see also by creating now different Lego bricks from these platform pieces really together to an application, you really are overlapping maybe with some of those uh, really considered as SaaS, as software as a service. But this is something we will then talk um, basically in the next lecture. Before we go now in an interesting set of advanced past topics and applications, let's look a little bit on the benefits, right? So that we can summarize from the first part and when you think about this, of course, always assume the developer perspective here in the first place, or let's say a development team leader that has to look at this um, from a more, let's say, in detail perspective. Of course, you always have to think about that many of these things cost, and perhaps if you do it too much with these costs and don't really foresee that basically in your budgeting as a manager of a company or startup, then uh, you are equally in trouble. But let's say uh, when you take the perspective of a developer or basically as a team lead, you have essentially all of these different benefits here. Usually you can really cut the coding time because everything is already provided in the right versioning. You have really scalable tools that automatically would scale, which is, as I said, one of the key differentiators, I think, than doing it locally on your little laptop. You can create an application quickly in the cloud, especially with a cloud platform, scaling from 10 users up to 10 million if you want. If you set, of course, a budget right, that of course would pay, but if you have a million users or more that would pay, let's say $5 for your app, then of course it multiplies. Important is here that you of course budget for that, um, that all of these tools also uh, bring benefits. So coding time less, which means more revenues maybe, but of course as the infrastructure and the pass itself is all the Lego bricks costs, put away this budget uh, and really um, be serious about that. So lots of development capabilities are also there. And we talked about the application lifecycle. By far, PaaS is not about just putting some libraries together. And this is a fact which is now comes together when we talk about Kubernetes as well and containers, but it's also about PaaS. And the second part will allude to this a bit more, <clears throat> really thinking about what a developer needs, right? When he has to create all of this. So, with this, you have lots of capabilities where you quickly can have even maybe new capabilities where your team is even not good in. Let's say machine learning takes a long time until you're really an expert in the field. As I said earlier, um, the things we learned in lecture two, lecture three are just the beginning. You have to learn about regularization, about um, statistical learning theory, the law of large numbers. You have to think about validation schemes with your data. So there's lots of lots of things on the way, but here and there, you see that more and more cloud services can automate the process. And automation is of course a big word, also alluding a little bit to Kubernetes, Mesos, the containers we will have then in another lecture, which is another aspect of this, to really have the whole application lifecycle deployment at scale. And with this essentially also better maintenance options um, all in one when you basically use a Google platform or other path services, which is of course another key benefit. Also, when you think about the plethora of services we have today, so we have multiple platforms in terms of mobile computing. We have different mobiles that can do something, but also still the desktop world. We have different uh, phones, um, apps, app stores, and you see more and more that all the clouds really are giving you the opportunity in their development environments to then deploy maybe on the Google Play Store and App Store, or so to speak, much more easier than you possibly maybe could do that all on your own single way. So it basically streamlines the process. And of course, when you do this developer developing for multiple platforms, again, you save cost, you save time. And all of the deployment ways, um, including the local loop, maybe that the libraries are in line with your ones, which you really have to deploy on the platforms is another big win. 
um, which you get in the clouds. Then um, the interesting thing is again, this pay as you go uh, model, right? Think about that, we discussed it before. What you don't really use, you don't have to pay, which is also benefit. Now, assuming again, that you have lots of these infrastructures along, you have a building server, you have a, you know, you're hosting your integrated development environment for your whole development team. You do lots of different things. Um, and maybe you want to have the cutting edge of those, meaning also some business intelligence goes alongside it. You will analyze users, not only program and develop. You want to know how much is actually this function really uh, used in this particular app or how many people are using this new functionality. So, or how many people really use with this data elements, any particular level or player in the game. So all the analytics, business intelligence, so analyzing really what's happening is of course sophisticating tools that you first have to install. You may have to make yourself extremely familiar with it if you want to install it, deploy it at scale. And you can come on to again, that again, this idea of reflecting on your development, right? What this really is in a way that also goes with a pay as you go model of thinking about you grow as you essentially, you know, grow also as a development team. And of course it goes without saying, I think these days we all experience that in a way with COVID-19 that supporting this geographically distributed development teams is much easier once you are already in the cloud developing. Of course, um, also organizations can do this with VPN and so on and having, you know, their servers behind this and protect it. But in a way you see that of course, remote development teams is much more easier to get there. And in a way, you could even harness different time zones, right? When you think about that, you have a company fraction of the company of developers maybe work in India was a famous model while we sleep here in Europe. So there are different ways how you can also make that happen to your advantage essentially, uh, which is quite interesting. So when you think about development, it is about developing software. And what we all essentially from our base studies probably know is there's some software development kit. There are APIs which you can use to do maybe, you know, several cloud services. We discussed, for instance, the search is a very prominent one. So this is of course a very interesting, but also thinking about accessing the S3, not in a click with the mouse, but of course you want to access it from really libraries you code, maybe in Java, maybe whatever tool it is, maybe in Python. So this is of course a key aspect of these developer tools, but you see there's a huge way, uh, not only related to the different languages with Java 8 and Python and Ruby and, and, and so on, there's a whole setup which is actually also supporting the life cycle again, or the deployment aspects. Again, I cannot go in all of this basically in this lecture, but it shows how PASS is of course extremely connected to elements like containers, container registries, uh, schedulers, but more notably also the deployment phases for having completely pipelines uh, with Kubernetes and, and so on. All of this we will look a little bit when we then think about um, lecture 12, right, where we have containers. So I'd shed just a little bit light here in this lecture to understand a little bit the relationship um, to this, but we will have much more of this when we then think about essentially lecture 12. So basically what I'm saying is they use virtualization, they all do. Um, we have already explored this, uh, whether it's for computing or essentially thinking about some different type of virtualization when it's about storage. We talked about just the bucket store, which is a form of virtualization. You don't really have a real file system anymore. You have just some metadata, some name, and you know, basically put there some, some interesting object into it, which could be seen as virtual. And then you have, of course, also different network virtual, let's say aspects to it. But the real thing I wanted to leave you on the table today would be this, because if you think about and comparing a little bit what we now learned in virtual machines in lecture four, and what will come in, in the containers in lecture 12 and why it's related to pass in a way, if you remember one of the um, aspects was also the operating systems, the environment again, where is the application that you put in the cloud, what it is using, the, the libraries, perhaps even the binaries. And of course, once you're at this level, 
with the binaries and, and so on, you're also talking already directly about the operating system. And then of course, directly about containers. So you see here on the, on the bottom left, a very nice short um, you know, comparison that we will reveal much more in lecture 12 where you have this virtual machines. Um, we know that already there's an infrastructure, meaning real hardware. There's a host operating system, but this is virtual machine hypervisor technologies. We could really then have different operating systems, maybe Linux, Mac, Windows, all basically on one machine. But what essentially the difference is now to this containers and why they basically reduce, for instance, the size of all of this is bestly explained again by, you know, these kind of aspect that containers abstract a little bit away the requirements from this um, operating system and providing already a specific runtime. Of course, this has certain limits and security considerations, which we will talk about in lecture 12, but this still has, of course, numerous supports to support different applications once you abstract from this. And if you think about that, you have an operating system already that carries the main essence of work for IT. If you do it now three times again and putting it and storing it maybe as an image, you have lots of size of space um, basically wasted for this, which maybe is not really needed for that. The other fact is then when you have, let's say more and more to manage, think about you starting with hybrid clouds, you suddenly have your own data center to manage. You have, uh, let's say Amazon, which is important for us for certain products or we once stored the data in. And as you know, taking data out costs, so we better leave it in, but we found the new features of the Google Cloud platform important, particularly maybe for deep learning, for machine learning. So I also want to use some of the Google Cloud platform services. So once you're starting with a, a huge set of different services, you know, interacting, um, partly deploying, of course, and also, you know, this is a, a real a well understood area today where there are different solutions and we will reveal them in lecture 12. But you see immediately, of course, that this has a major impact to your application. And this will be then related what we also capture in lecture 12. Here is one good example where you think um, for pass, it really matters. If you think now you would have more or less a deep learning platform, something we also had more with the AMI interface with virtualization, but it was a bit more because it was not only about the virtualization, it was also that all the software, all the libraries, TensorFlow, Keras, all of them were readily deployed in the AMI in, in Lecture 8. Now here we have a very similar aspect, of course, with the deep learning containers, where you have lots of popular data science frameworks already included that you need then for deep learning. So when we think about other um, application areas of PaaS, um, then we are quickly at this data analytics as I already alluded to in the first part of the lecture. So thinking about, um, you know, you maybe want to analyze data quickly. Some people call it today smart analytics. Also basically Google changes its name every now and then. What remains are basically some of those key properties in terms of services. While of course we see comparisons to many years before, they get more and more services and also more particularly tuned to several different um, areas of application development, uh, which would be data catalogs. So metadata plays suddenly more a role to find data, discovering data, but also for different application domains, you see specific services for the life sciences community, for instance, because they have this gene sequencing or in general biomedical data may be very interesting requirements. And also when you think about more about patients data, also more security requirements uh, in terms of what you really store there. So this means basically the catalog gets bigger and bigger in terms of services that you're available. But we see, for instance, things like BigQuery which is very well known um, and or data proc, which we also basically were already shortly having a hint to saying that of course, Microsoft Hardy Insight are not the only ones that deploy Apache Spark or Hadoop in the cloud. You also find this in the Google landscape by just using the data proc. And with this, it's not only Apache Spark and Hadoop, as you can imagine, in the end, you have the whole open source uh, data analytics frameworks that we discussed. So including HBase possibilities and then so forth. 
So everything which essentially works together with Apache Spark and Apache Hadoop, the MapReduce idea and so forth, you have also in the Google Cloud. And I think that's, that's pretty clear. Some examples are again from customers below, which are, let's say, also very well known and also shed some light what it really means to adopt this for a company like Vodafone that has essentially nothing to do with being a data center provider, right? So Vodafone has its strength in the network, in the remaining about the mobile network, of course, and the, the stores, why they should create, let's say, another, let's say, big data center. So you see here, as an example, that the Vodafone group really moved lots of those um, servers from Hadoop, which were self-managed by Vodafone, into the cloud from Google. And basically, of course, this is a huge cost if you think about it, but of the other way, you see Vodafone is also a huge market and mobile phones is, uh, they're a big player. And just to shed some light, what what it means in terms of production, what I particularly liked in this example here, is 226 models running in production. So this could be partly machine learning models, it could be indexing models, as we learned from Facebook, right? So that some of them use the MapReduce with HBase for indexing just data, which is a very important task if you want to have really Facebook click, click, and then see the information, yeah? So, this is a really interesting aspect because it also reflects what I see in my production here daily in machine learning or data mining. People don't have just one model and many people underestimate this. It's, it's really lots of models that analyze customer data, that analyze yourself when you want to have personalization in machine learning in data mining, this is not just one model. It has different machine learning models. It uses different models from data to really understand your behavior, your shopping behavior up to clicking, logging, what you do, how long you are on websites, heat maps, what products you might find interesting. So you go again and again to all of these different deployments of that. That is really a good example for machine learning that basically to really um, strive in an organization, you just don't have one big artificial neural network that rules everything or one deep learning network that rules everything. You would have around 100 to 200 as a big company and maybe 50 as a startup to really um, understand um, what's going on with different machine learning models or those that just supporting machine learning here. And one things we learned from Gabriel was, you know, feature engineering, data selection, feature selection, and so on. Because all of these models share usually that you don't execute on all the data, right? You pick certain data for certain problems, make a model out of it and deploy it. That's what meant in production. So they're using it daily. Another example I just wanted to shed light on and we go into this also a little bit in detail when we think about uh, Twitter. I think that's pretty um, clear to everyone what pr Twitter does. Um, also here you see that they had on-premises Hadoop, things we discussed, right? So does it really make sense to make it on-premise? You have Twitter people um, administrating, uh, administration of, you know, Hadoop clusters or Spark clusters. You have Twitter people suddenly being experts in hardware or want to be. Um, and they cannot really scale because they, it's their only kind of application is just Twitter, right? So. Um, in this sense, why not going to the Google Cloud? And I'm not selling that here, so I know sometimes that sounds like I'm selling that here. Of course, for companies like Twitter, this would be a big move to do that. But you see also these people really put people from, from different experts really to analyze that first before they make this move. And then usually they have predictions about that it's much more cost effective to do so. Um, to do basically much more things in a performant way, which we care about as end customers, query tweets, users, impressions. And of course, impressions is, is a key concern here. We will come back to this when you think about that Twitter runs around an ad business, right? So it's all about ads and showing them, getting revenues, how many people clicked, click through rates, impressions of ads and so forth. And so we will talk about this as well. But, and of course, as this helps now, this Hadoop, not any more to do on your own, but rather using the Google Cloud Platform, you have to pay a lot, but through the ad business, you maybe get it much quicker back than you basically spend it in the Google Cloud. Just because for Google, of course, this is just modus operandi. They can have this economics of scale, many different customers from Vodafone to Twitter. They all do the same. 
more or less. They just execute some Spark jobs, but of course, um, that's what they can in order of scale and magnitudes. So another example here then, when you dive deeper then is not only that they use Hadoop, of course, if you think about and read a little bit up on Twitter, what they do to modernize really their platform for tweets, right? Again, think about for them, this is a platform. Um, Twitter is essentially needing something which is um, thinking about their advertising platform as some sort of um, system which should be fast because that's where my money comes from. But the problem is it's based on many, many different metrics. So how long have people seen all the billions of tweets per day? How long have people, you know, looking at, at things, sharing, liking, and, and, and so on. So there are lots of metrics um, that go a long way through all this different, let's say, ads that people are actually putting through these tweets. Um, by promoting, maybe you can promote your profile, you can promote um, different posts you do. So essentially this is where you pay for, right? Which is a direct revenue for them. But of course they put it back to the Google infrastructure to be fast because if you have as an ad manager from some big up company or if you do it yourself, you want to track the spending. You want to know based on you know how many impressions you have to pay or how many clicks you have to pay to basically have more followers. There are lots of different models. We cannot go on all the different details, but you can make sure that you want to know um, track, that your track ad actually is basically uh, really up to date in terms of spending and to really maybe also cancel campaigns when it's you know not working. So you're essentially interested in the efficiency of this campaign that you're running. And for this, you need up-to-date metrics. Now, this is not a problem if you do your personal tweet channel and be you know looking about a couple of tweets perhaps, but think about Twitter as a company giving that as a platform out to people that running ads. So now you're in a complete different position. You have to do it on an order of scale for all the different users. You have to have up-to-date information of key decision makers that will decide, do I really put $50,000 in at a tweet, Twitter tweets or do I put it to Facebook tweets, uh, Facebook ads, right? So of course you think about that there are different channels today. People talk about channels in that, Instagram, uh, you name it, right? LinkedIn is a channel. Twitter is a channel, Facebook is a channel, all of them have an ad idea of putting that. So why I should put it on Twitter when I don't have good metrics, when I don't see that my, let's say, marketing campaign really works well. However, I don't want to stress too much the business part of it. I think many of you have advertising every day when we go to the internet. Here's just the scale that I want to point out. If you think about a, a huge company like Twitter, that of course has to have a, a very large infrastructure usually in, in their own on-premise organization or in different data centers actually given the size of Twitter. But here they have this BigQuery for instance which is an interesting uh, data warehouse solution really which is optimized for certain batch queries and uh, this is something where exactly this ad platform alongside many other actually parts they also use from this as you see in the architecture on the right hand side right the big query is of course one interesting aspect if you think about just uh, lots of lots of data that is there so the data part in twitter is of course an important part the other one i wanted to stress that we will also have a little bit in the streaming lecture that will come to at the end of the course is Twitter has a second part, it's not only about information, it's about tweeting quickly, right? If you think about sometimes Twitter can really have a momentum in tweets, retweeting, and the, then lots of people liking the tweets, retweeting again, it gets a viral essentially. You need to have something which is then suddenly really scaling up to some post that you never know that may be scaling up that much, right? So, and there they have lots of different ways how to scale with this and to work on it with a batch layer we discuss here of running certain queries about several aspects you already know. The HDFS is new, the Hadoop distributed file system because there may be different data centers involved and, and so on. You see that is on-premise data centers, but given the same batch layer with what we discussed in the HDFS, they can easily connect then to the Google Cloud, giving the same infrastructure type, and then having this path services like the cloud storage and also the BigQuery here for really um, batch queries really on the data in a high performant way um, to be done. 
uh, very efficiently. So this is a, I think, very good example to show. Um, Angry Birds is another interesting example. Of course, I could bear, be in, in many different aspects on the same path. It's about storage, about Google data, uh, storage that is used. But um, think about also the app platform that is, of course, used here. Um, and more notably here, it's about the scale. If you think about that we have many, millions of downloads and users all the time. And this was a startup in the beginning. So they really had to grow with the infrastructure, with the number of users. We also explore that some of those services are not really used anymore, right? Given evolution. So maybe they use somewhere else an Amazon part of the cloud. So one of the things I just wanted to point out here are two things for the, for the Angry Birds one. Of course, from data store or the task queues we just discussed a little bit. Uh, think about also this memcache API they use, um, which is really boosting the performance by having lots of these um, caches, which means, for instance, in Angry Birds, you don't have to reload certain aspects again and again with the same query about the level data, right? When you're running through levels or something like this. The users API, people can now use their Google usernames, passwords. All this API business is usually really very cumbersome from developers in the security federated identity domain with OAuth interfaces and so on. Very interesting material and for usability incredibly important, but you don't want to really deal with that. So in this sense, they are, let's say again, different platform as a service um, bricks that you know um, they use, but here it's also important to understand that some of the bricks they stop using also at some point in time. Uh, which is, I think, a very good example here because they may be growing to a way or they want to diff use different users in other clouds. And uh, this is an, in a kind of situation which I can go on now. I think it would not add to insight that you can imagine that many apps are very similar. They load again data, they have some certain queries to the data and so forth. Given it's also a little bit, you know, a machine learning, deep learning course um, of sort, um, at least from the application perspective, it's also good to understand that there is a lot of things happening as well. So when we just talked about the platform pieces, which are, let's say, in a way a bit stupid, which is not true because they have their smart analytics or they have their smart, um, let's say unique selling proposition like Google Big Table or so, right? So it is a smart approach. What I mean more is to have really learning systems and really bricks or Lego bricks, which are not easily to, to copy and to do it on your own organization. With this, I mean really sophisticated models from speech to text, text to speech. Of course, you find here and there some pre-trained networks in the, let's say, open source domain. Uh, that's not to be argued about. But if you think how strong Google is alone from the cloud translation, if you remember Google Translate and the API, the trained models behind that is, of course, an order of magnitude scale that they could offer when you use these services. And you see really a growing fraction in that over the last five years, given also the momentum, of course, we've seen with deep learning. Um, but here particularly, I picked a field which you didn't cover that much yet, which is natural language processing, NLP. So this is also a machine learning part, which is incredibly important today. I mean, you have heard already about Alexa, you know that machine learning plays a huge role today. And uh, also the cloud platform here has numerous, let's say building blocks, which you could use to create a higher level product, right? Where you can maybe have the text to speech a brick just used for some certain element of your particular application. An example I wanted to give is um, a sentiment analysis, for instance, which we have again and, and again here and there with different perspective as an example. Always the idea is to get, let's say, really um, out of this natural language processing in a way, um, really the, the statistics, is it is a good or bad customer perspective or experience, right? So you see the whole pipeline down there. No matter what it is, we had seen the Chicago example with, you know, kind of basically the ratings or so in the controlling and checking of the restaurants. It could be orders, receipts, invoices, no matter what text you have, you can basically use that and, and see about can you find a pattern in that that has more negative or positive trend. 
right? And what you can easily do is to train a classifier on this these days, similar like we did in the food inspection in Chicago in lecture two, right? And three then, essentially th saying that the sentiment analysis is incredibly often used, especially in business today, if you want to have your social media checked to evaluate, is basically the general audience thinking about this product in a rather positive or negative way. So there's also, of course, once you have trained the model, then the really production part of it to really get insights. What is actually happening with my product? The sentiment analysis, whatever product that might be, or let's say even about information, more generally speaking, must not be about a product, could be complaints about some certain restaurant. It's not really something you can buy as a product, but of course buy as food. So it's also important um, as we have seen in the food inspection example. And the interesting thing with AutemL here, um, I'm alluding to a little bit to this, um, but of course you could do more sophisticated models with all this language processing elements here. You have some certain tools which took you, will took you a long time to develop that on your own, this pipeline and everything. And here you just have, of course, essentially one service which is very simple to use just to basically stick in the data and it will almost automatically, as the name suggests, create the real classifiers for it and to, to get with this task. Only because sentiment analysis is very good understood. Uh, and the same, of course, is true when you think about translation from different languages. Should, this shouldn't be a problem now. We know what we're doing there. And of course, we know that Google is quite strong in that field, so they offer it back as a service. Now, when you think about maybe more product perspective where I can now industry-wide can integrate these cloud products where you don't think about maybe that I'm at IKEA, I'm not, I'm completely unrelated to this cloud. I am actually doing um, things like flowers, but also furniture. And um, I do lots of other stuff, but I, what I don't care is IT, right? So as IKEA, uh, my business is somewhere else. But of course, they can then use with, for instance, solutions for retail here, do interesting things where you would say there's a direct connection then to IKEA. If you think about the size, if you move through IKEA, you see they again and again have their products somewhere put um, in different, let's say, locations. And if you want to know where it is and what the price is, you can simply today here use an app, put a photo on it then take a photo and it will automatically analyze the IKEA product and will show to you what are these products potentially. You know, machine learning is maybe never 100% correct. So it will maybe list three or five options as basically shown here in the, in the figure. And of course, what you see behind there are convolutional neural networks that we learned about detecting image analysis. Here maybe more on a scene-wide, not on a pixel-wide classification scheme that you really found directly matches in your product database for IKEA. And then you know where exactly you can get the product in this, let's say, huge chain of running from chamber to chamber, where I just maybe want to have some shortcuts to get to the product I want. So this is a good example that, of course, by using the Google Cloud also for this, again, for app development, um, you have, of course, lots of benefits as IKEA, right? Things we discussed, they don't have big developers. They're just having a couple that putting that app together with pieces of software, which are in the Google Cloud. The second part is, of course, for Google then, on the other hand, this is not just valid for IKEA. This is a huge field in retail. And we have also essentially more about um, retail coming in some of the lectures. Uh, later when uh, my PhD student Shadi Barakat will talk about retail. So images play a role part, whether they have more, let's say, database enrichment in terms of forms or colors of your product that enrich your metadata about the products you sell, or basically what's happening right now more and more is this kind of visible shopping or image-based shopping, right? You have something you want to have, you take basically the, the at-home your shoes and you go to basically a shoe retail and then you just put in another image and it should locate you which shoes actually from all of these uh, many ones look very similar like to those. Uh, this is a field that is coming and also fueled by many of these cloud services and machine learning and deep learning particularly because it has a huge now impact in computer vision. Right, towards the end, I also want to warn a little bit about some certain aspects. And you can imagine that this is a little bit about the, the 
positioning of hardware in this. So when you have very certain applications on the platform as a service, you would, let's say, tune for very specific hardware just given by one vendor, then you could think of, um, you know, tuning it really on the low scale what you could do with a TPU here, we learned that the tensor processing unit, which is in the Google Cloud, that you also actually could use in the Google Call-Up, if you remember. If this is a very specific device that is not on the market. So in a sense, you would say you have a vendor lock. Luckily, you could say also TensorFlow I have used somewhere else, right? So of course, this is much more about low level tunings to certain hardware if a cloud provider is having this. And it becomes more meaningful if you go to the platform as a service level, because you're not just using the infrastructure, but you have maybe different APIs already connected to your applications depending on it. And when you think this and grow that up to everything, um, when you think about now you're someone who just want to use paths from many different people, you have different clouds which are out there from Google, to Microsoft, we didn't even have talked about some others like Salesforce, Amazon, and so forth. Most of them have a wide variety of languages and developer tools. Think about the Microsoft world with the .NET framework, which is very important there. The Visual Studios that you maybe know from Microsoft versus the open source on Google with Java, IDEs, Eclipse. So all of these are basically a little bit vendor dependent. That's what we look at, more vendor lock aspects when you have your developers trained on a specific IDE and then suddenly they want to also use Microsoft, then they suddenly have to go completely into the .NET framework. Of course, these, these boundaries are vanishing again. So of course, you will find also open source tool in Microsoft Azure as we did. But of course, you see that of course, the products are kind of tuned really to that models. We talked about the different programming models um, that are provided by the providers. More MapReduce is almost everywhere, but if you go to the details, they have also different ways how you execute workflows, where you have different threads and tasks supported. And when you then think about the storage, then you have lots of different options. You remember Bigtable was now, and no SQL data spaces might be a very important part. Others have very specific customer relationship management software. Others are strong maybe in e-commerce and, and things like that. So the point I'm getting it is essentially the next slide before I close this lecture today saying, um, we have a lack of standards here and I was involved many years here and there in the OCCI interface of the Open Grid Forum to establish, let's say, a cloud vendor neutral standard between different layers and this is not really working. You see also other approaches which in a way don't really have a full grip on the vendors and you see here the ECMA. But the point is also why that is the case. And you see that the vendors have significant dominance these days. Um, I talked about S3, which is by far, I think the best example where Amazon is not following this standard, it's essentially setting the standard. And in former times there were also then changes of the interface APIs. And by changing these interface APIs, you know, lots of people that built their software on it had to change again their software. So what we really need is here an example of what, what basically one Mania Soft Aneka was trying to achieve. And as I said, it's, it's relatively um, questionable if that's really in the end successful, right? That you have common abstraction layers where you have certain standards based on, which are really approved by standardization bodies, something like ESO or IEEE. So people that really are vendor neutral, instead of just, let's say, following what's happening in the vendor domain. Also, when you think about containers, a similar way to Docker was dominating a lot and now found a way, you know, in different cloud vendors, you could say we're moving there towards the standard with containers. I will also talk a little bit about again, when we talk about containers, which are quite important today. Still, it's an, a different level talking about standards on the API level that we know from operating systems, for instance, right? When you want to work with a file, uh, when you do anything, which is so fundamental that many other applications are based on it, um, then you basically have a problem in the cloud. There's a huge amount of services without any big standards essentially, and all the standardization activities are going rather slow. And if so, they succeed, it's a question of how many cloud vendors really you know, adopting that. 
The same is true for thinking about uh, machine learning. When you think about, you have now a deep learning network that is dropped to disk, so to speak, and you want to have it to reuse it in another cloud with another framework. There are, let's say, some actions on the way to standardize how you store a deep learning framework that is trained. But it has also not really directly yet the full impact that we want so that we can now switch to every, everywhere and then just can reuse it. And I think with this, I'm really um, on all I wanted to tell you today um, about using this. Uh, you can imagine that natural language processing would be a complete university lecture on its own, right? So not talking about clouds and paths and all sorts, natural language processing is a massive field, a very interesting field. And if you look on this video, um, I picked this because it's, it's showing a little bit light on this huge variety, but also that, of course, when you go to clouds, you hear and there have the interesting aspect of what you see here in the video already explained, that you could also maybe use different frameworks here for predictions, like Keras you see as the best performance, for what reason ever, um, or TensorFlow, essentially. Um, so you can quickly, essentially, jump from one framework to another one, right? Which is another benefit really here for the cloud. Otherwise, if you do it on-premise on your own, you always have to install it, right? You have heard basically um, Rocco, one of my PhD students, having experience with Horovod. Now he wants to do, you know, basically this deep speed, the new framework for it. And if you don't use it in the cloud, essentially developers have to do it on their own. They have to do their own experience, reading it to it. This all costs a company, so scientists like that, but a company think about this, this is just overhead. They want to have solutions. All right, so that's all basically for today. You have lots of references and I could add maybe more and more, but I think it did not add to the, to the main impact of PaaS. Uh, also some PaaS aspects will be better understood when we talk about SaaS, what we do on Thursday. So see you then.